Oh, OK, cool. So hey, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming to the talk here. I'm going to be talking about all your baseline or belong to us. As you can tell right away, um, I don't have good Photoshop skills, <laughs> so uh, bear with me. So uh, a couple of it's yes. A <laughs> um, couple disclaimers. I'm speaking on behalf of myself, so anything I get right or wrong on me, um, we just have to put that because my employer asks me to. And this is the second installment of another rant. Um, my name's Mick Douglas. I'm a very angry geek. Um, and actually, I think some of you are angry geeks too. I've heard some things said in the hallway that, you know, there's some stuff that's just wrong in the biz. And people are having a hard time articulating it because it's a fun industry. You know, we love what we do. And it's kind of hard to throw a critical eye on something that you love. And um, I'm just throwing some ideas out here about some of the things that make me angry. And hopefully you'll get some ideas on how to make your job suck just a little less. Um, I am a pen tester professionally, but I love, love, love the blue team. I've uh, been systems and network administrator for quite some time, uh, including at the university networks, which, you know, God love them. That's a rough, rough uh, job. You can follow me on Twitter at Better Safety Net, and I've had way too much coffee today, so we'll see how this goes. Like I said, I'm a pen tester for a bank. I love my job. However, I also do pen testing on the side and um, have done that for quite some time. And I'm here to tell you that it's too easy. It's not that I'm really all that awesome. You know, I have friends who are much more awesome that I ask them, hey, how would I do this? How would I do that? It's just that currently it's a little too easy. So I want to talk about this talk. First of all, rabid dog is rabid. I'm angry. There's a lot to be upset about in the industry. So understand that you know there's a lot of passion and anger coming from me, and I think you have it too. Tap that anger. Release it. Channel it appropriately. This is not going to be a super elite talk where I'm going to be talking about O days and memory registers and all that sort of stuff. I'm sorry. That's just not really what I'm doing. What I'm here to do is teach you some strategic things that you can do at your day-to-day -day job that will make it much harder for the bad guys. And certainly the rabbit hole goes very deep um, later on, but that's up to you. You can do that on your own. Another thing is, what we're going to be talking about is very legal. Big ups and love to uh, John Strand and Paul Asadorian when they gave their talk on um, hacking back. That's really cool, and I like the fact that they're furthering the discussion and making that happen. But this talk is about furthering defense legally. It's still more than I've seen most people do. It's going to be a very active form of defense but it in no way goes beyond your network, okay? So the judge there likes it, your corporate lawyers will like it, your manager will like it, it's gonna be good stuff. Now, uh, fair warning, there's two other very cool technical talks going on. Um, so uh, folks watching the video, um, make sure that you check them out. Ryan Lin is giving a talk on how to steal underpants from the network. And then uh, the state of the Metasploit framework is going on by Egypt. You should check out both of those talks once they're posted online. But don't leave, because then I'd have lower self-esteem. All right, so recap. I said that this was a talk, part two of a rant. Um, that I had earlier. Um, one weekend, many months ago, I was presenting both in West Virginia, thanks for inviting me, and then also in um, uh, Cleveland for the B-sides. And it was Blue Team is Sexy, talking about how the red team is getting just a little too much glory, in my opinion, and that we need to start giving you know, love and accolades to the blue team. The blue team, there's always going to be more blue teamers. There's always going to be um, a need for protecting the stuff. And while it's all neat and cool that 
you know, the red team gets the glory, we need to come up with some ways to make the blue team get the love and respect they deserve. And that was the big thrust of that talk. You can check them out. Uh, Iron Geek has them on his website. And, um, you know, thanks for hosting those videos, Adrian. Um, it had a whole lot of high-level suggestions in terms of like how you can further your career, what you can do to make your network better and safer. And, um, you know, I'm not tooting my own horn. A lot of people came up after the talk and they were like, hey, Mick, I liked that talk. It was really cool. It was really neat. Except this one person came up to me and they were livid. They were just angry. And they said, how dare you? And I was like, whoa, I'm sorry. And they're like, how dare you try to get up there and tell me that blue team is sexy. Blue team sucks. Blue team is set up to fail. And you're this guy who escaped blue team and you're now red team ninja, like talking up blue team. How dare you? And I was like, what? <laughs> I don't get it. I really was being quite honest. Blue team is sexy and it needs more love. And then I thought, well, maybe this person was trolling me. I don't know. On the off chance that they weren't, this thing just kind of festered in my brain and it rotted and I got angrier and angrier and angrier. And that's what happened is this talk. And I'm going to say some controversial things like this. The information security, we know that it's not good. I see you nodding. You're like, yep, yep, we could be doing better. Well, and that's true. Because we've got a lot of bad situations. We've got angry auditors. We've got carefree cacker, crackers. <laughs> well, no, I'm from the school of thought that you're uh, going to be calling the bad hackers crackers. Yeah, I should have thought about that, but I'm in Kentucky when I <laughs> put that in here. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but, you know, if you think about it, it, I gave my talk, I don't know, eight months ago maybe, maybe a little longer than that. What's been going on in the news lately? It's been bad. It's been real bad. They used to be good. How many people would trust a Komodo signed site? Hmm, I wouldn't. Epsilon, I'm sorry, Sarah, a friend of mine works there. Um, Sony, I mean, we could do a whole talk on all the fail that they did. Actually, it would probably be a whole track on the fail that they did. <laughs> Fox News Channel, Twitter saying that Obama's dead? Really? Lockheed Martin, they have kind of important stuff. You'd want them to protect that. They hacked PBS? They gave us Reading Rainbow. I mean, come on. Now, I will give them, I, I, you know, so like, I don't condone illegal activity, but the fact that they got the word out that Pac is still alive, that was cool. Um, L3 Communications, more fail, Northrop, you know, big names, people's Gmail accounts were getting popped all over the place, Acer, that doesn't show up too well, sorry. InfraGuard Atlanta, now, in InfraGuard's defense, they were in the Atlanta market, and we all know that Gregory Evans, the world's foremost hacker, is there, so, you know, it was only a matter of time, right? U.S. Senate. H.B. Gary, oh my gosh, look, oh, he just made the baby cry. You know, we could keep going on, but we just got to stop. You know, there's too much fail. Blue team. That's right, we need the blue team. We need the blue team badly. Use the papers, use these news articles, use these as ammunition when you talk to your you know, your board of directors, your manager, whoever. Have a little elevator speech. You know, when there's something in the USA Today, Wall Street Journal, whatever magazine or news source they read, do some, you know, intel gathering on your management. Find out where they get their, their news. Watch the news for these sorts of events and say, boy, 
it really stink to have all our emails stolen like Epsilon. And they'd go, wait, they can do that? And say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember that patch that I wanted to apply? And you said that I can't do it because we don't have a maintenance window until July of 2015? If we can patch that, we will be a much harder target. And they'll be like, much more receptive. So it's a good thing to be doing. Basically, we need to reevaluate. We need to stop and think, are we doing the right thing? I know that we're all working really hard. I mean, show of hands, who here is working in the information security business and they feel like they just punched the time card and they're just like, hmm, boy, I'm hardly working. No one. That's right, we're working real hard. So we need to reevaluate. We need to take a good long look in the mirror, figure out what we can do better. And there's a lot that we can do better. But you got to be honest when you're looking in the mirror. <laughs> so there's, there's some options that we have, right? You know, different companies based off of their culture, based off of how much funds they have, they're going to take different responses. Now, some of them might not go to, you know, the most constructive things, but they'll go the fun route, you know, hey, let's just drink it up and party while Rome burns. And there's a lot of people who actually are doing this. There's more are taking this see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. They're signing the NDAs, they're going to the various, um, you know, consulting companies, some of them good, some of them not so good, and just saying, here, make the problem go away. I don't care, I don't care. And that's not as productive as it could be, or should be, rather. And then some people just get straight up depressed and go emo. And what I want you to understand is that you shouldn't do that. Don't ever give up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the status quo, where are we at? OK, this is where I'll put my pen tester red team hat on and let you know what I think of things. <laughs> <laughs> Mugging for the camera. Um, antivirus. It's not doing so hot, you know? Those of you who are in the technical tracks will be well familiar with tools like Shikataganai or other packers that allow you to take known malware, stuff that just works, repackage it, reconfigure it, and make it run as if the antivirus wasn't even there. Now, I'm not saying ditch antivirus entirely. Don't. It does serve a very valuable uh, purpose. I mean, it is a hurdle. It's a worthy hurdle. But don't put all your eggs into that basket. Likewise, firewall IDS and IPS. Many people think that, oh, we've got our firewall, we've got our IDS, we've got IPS, we're good to go. Again, there's technical ways around this. If you've got an IDS and IPS, I can use tools like FragRoute and twist the packets and make them look so bizarre that they won't match your signature base. Effectively making that, you know, 20 to, you know, 20,000 to 1 million dollar appliance that you have blinking in the data center, a waste of money. But you still need those tools because you're going to be stopping a lot of the script kitties. Firewalls are actually um, very needed, but with client-side exploits and reverse shells, they're practically not even there. So the things that we are relying on are, are letting us down. And in a way, our defensive posture now is that we're hoping the attacker runs into the tree that we set for them. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think that sounds like a good strategy. It's very easy to just veer and dodge. And I got bad news for you. It gets a little worse than that. There's no silver bullets. Anyone who says that they can come in and give you the compliance appliance, or that they've got this method, or they've got this widget, or this application, and all your problems go away, they're lying. Santa's going to bring them lumps of coal, so, you know, it, Karma evens out a little bit, but it's not going to be quite what you are hoping for. So there's no silver bullets. And there's certainly none of these silver bullets, because that's just nasty beer. 
I've got bad news for you. I'm going to drop a couple four-letter words here. If you're squeamish, look away now. Ugh. Ooh, boo. You know what? Screw that. I don't want to do like hard work. Let's just stick with work. Well, what if instead of just doing hard work, because we're already doing that, what if we work smarter? Oh. <laughs> what if... You know, we start doing what management will always tell you, that old cliche. Hey, Mick, I want you to go look after the low-hanging fruit. Well, I'm here to tell you there's good news. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit on the orchard that is information security. In fact, there's so much low-hanging fruit, if you run through that orchard, you're liable to get a black eye. One of the things that fits, a, in my mind, as a black eye, is we have tools available that are just awesome. I'm going to tell you about one. It's a network-based tool. Now, what if this tool could tell when there's any changes on the network? Now, this is the interactive part of the show. Show of hands, would you be interested in knowing when something changes on your network? Yeah, okay, yeah, everybody's like, yeah, of course I'd want to know. All right, what if this tool could check for vulnerabilities? Show of hands, yeah, very interested, yeah. Validated your firewall and router ACLs, yeah, yeah, very interested. What if it could even be used to check for the presence of rootkits? Oh my God, shut up and take my money now, right? This is an amazing tool. You're interested, I can tell, because you're looking at me, you're riveted. Nmap, what? Did Mick just lose his mind? No. Nmap has this possibility because baselines. If you baseline your network, if you baseline your hosts, if you baseline your applications, you are going to be sitting pretty. I just used Nmap as an example, and I'm going to show some ways that you can do that in a bit. The thing you need to take away, though, from this talk is that when you think baseline, think of knowledge. And as we all learned from Schoolhouse Rock, knowledge is power. One of the most satisfying things of being a pen tester is when I come in and I'm filing my report for the assessment and I say, here's your network topology. And they say, oh, no, 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 no. We, we already have our, our network topology. Look at this Visio diagram. And I'm like, yeah, I, uh, I know. But um, actually, here's the subnet that you didn't even know existed. Here's this router that's talking to this other router that you didn't know worked. The reason that bad guys are able to succeed is they know our applications, they know our databases, they know our processes, they know our network better than we do. When that happens, that's asymmetric warfare. You're going to lose. They're coming at you with assault rifles and you've got a folding knife. You're not going to win. The good news is you have access to your network. You have access to all these systems. So you will be able, or you should be able, to create baselines that will allow you to have the knowledge that they seek. It's the entire reason why red team people spend so much time doing recon on a network. They need to know everything about the network. So do you. So let's go back and look at Nmap. Nmap, while many of you are familiar with it as a packet you know, generator that will check for open ports, it has many features, many, many features, some of which are very underutilized. NDIF, NSE, and rootkit finding capabilities are things that Nmap supports. So let's look at NDIF. Step one, just run your own standard, typical, you know, Nmap scan. In your flags, make sure that you do a dash O capital X, and that will export the output into an XML file. 
That's not a big hard change. Save that XML file. Put it somewhere safe. Let time pass. Whether it's next week, next quarter, after your next compromise, I don't know. But time passes. Rescan your network. Make sure you include the dash O, capital X, and save it to another XML file. Run NDIF, and it will tell you what ports, what hosts are new from your last time you ran it. Setting up a script that does an Nmap diff scan hopefully shouldn't take you more than a half day. You can set this up, and for some of you, you're like, well, dude, I've already done that. You know, it's not a hard task, but the benefits are huge. You can use this as change validation, which management's going to be like, ooh, change management validation, we'd love that. It's a surefire way, though, to see if somebody's opening up new services. I can't tell you how many times I've been in networks where, as I'm doing a pen test, I see the developers installing web servers on their machines and turning them off and on, and I can tell when they do that because I'm using a tool just like NDIF. It's incredibly powerful. Let's talk some NSE. NSE is um, NMAP Scripting Engine. And what it allows you to do, it's written in Lua, which is a scripting programming language, and it allows you to custom craft packets and interact with services. There's literally hundreds of pre-built NSE scripts that you just need to call from the command line, and it will interact with that, that machine in the way that you want. Now, it's hugely hugely powerful and it's got a lot of different components so some people think of it like this and I gotta tell you I like that that idea because you know if I'm breaking into the house and you know this guy comes around the corner I'm gonna be like oh I made the wrong choice of houses to break into <laughs> here's just a couple of the features that NSE uh, supports you can use it to find vulnerabilities you know uh, Everybody remember Conficker? You can use NSE scripts to find machines that are vulnerable to Conficker. It's very quick, very lightweight touch on a system, and it's very, very fast. You can also use it to test or run exploits. There's a whole class of NSE scripts called exploits that, surprise, surprise, contain exploits. You know, um, a lot of times people get really uh, geared up on Metasploit, great tool, Canvas, great tool, Core, also a great tool, but they forget about things like NSE. There's NSE scripts that you just type, 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 and you've got root. It's just that easy. Firewalk. Uh, earlier, a couple slides ago, I said that you know Nmap can be used for firewall validation. For those of you who don't know, Firewalk is one of the best ways to validate which rules are actively in place in firewalls. And I'm not going to name the vendor, but there, a couple years ago, there was a vendor that when you put in a certain rule and hit apply, if you used Firewalk to test it, that rule did not actually take effect. So using something like Firewalk, even though you, you know, trust your firewall, I personally think is well worth the time and effort. And it's not that much because the script's already done. FTP bounce scans are an amazing way to get around firewalls and IDSs. Why do you want to be caught as the one doing the port scan when you can blame it on the multifunction printer that has FTP running in it? Hmm. You can also do password brute forcing. There's tons of password brute force attack scripts out there that are already done. And there's many, many more. And bonus, it's Lua, so you can write your own. You can take a script that's already out there, tweak it a little bit, and you're off to the races. It's great. Now, this is the one where I saw some people kind of uh, furrow their brows. Rootkit detection with Nmap, yes. It's not foolproof, but it's a real cool way. Here's how it works. Step one, you scan another machine that you think might have a rootkit. Okay, nothing really hot there. Step two, the machine that you believe is compromised, you say, hey, Netstat, tell me what ports are open. And then you get that result and you look at them. 
if you come back and your external Nmap scan shows, say, 2,000 ports, and when you do your net stat and you've only got like four, you might have a problem. It's something that you're going to have to look at. And that's just the network layer. We can do this sort of work for any other item. You know, you can do this for your servers, you can do this for your applications, but I want to talk and spend a little bit of time about databases. I love databases. The reason why? All the corporate crown jewels are going to be inside there. I don't, you know, it's neat when people are like, ooh, I got shell on a box, ooh, yeah, yippity skippity. You know, but it's, there's a special kind of, like, gut damage that happens to the salespeople when you're like, hey, guess what I was able to do, salesperson? I was able to pull down the entire sales leads uh, table. For some places, that would be game over. So, with databases, it's really easy to do this sort of baseline detection. You should already have database logging enabled. All you have to do is look for the things that don't fit. And you might say to yourself, well, it's a really big database, it's really complex, and you know what, I hear you, I believe you, I am not you know, condescending your data store at all. It, it probably is big, it probably is complex, but stop and think, how often does your database change its schema? For those of you who aren't DBAs, that means that you're either adding columns to the tables, you're removing columns to the tables, you're adding new tables. That doesn't happen very often. And chances are you should be pre-warned about that if you have a change management process. If you have a baseline of what your database is supposed to look like and you compare that to what your database actually is like, that lights up like a Roman candle. How often are you dropping tables? And by the way, I'm going to take a moment for a side rant. Um, if you're a pen tester and you've got like SQL injection stuff, it's, yes, it's fun to do a drop table. It's actually mo better fun to do truncate table. The reason why is when you do that, um, you delete all the data inside the database, but you keep the data structure so that the, the web app continues to work. There's just no data there. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's amazing. Amazing when I go and um, I've done lots of incident response, and one of the first things I, I'll do is like, well, let's look at the transaction logs, let's look at the activity logs for the database, and you just look and you're like, well, I, you know, drop table, it's right there. Is that normal? And they're like, well, golly gee, no. Well, why weren't you looking for that? You know, that sort of stuff is what I'm talking about, the low-hanging fruit that's going to give you the black eye. How often do you have people logging in as root or SA or other, like, hyper-elevated accounts? It shouldn't be that often. If it is, you might want to stop and reevaluate your environment. So what else can we do with baselines? What other things are good ideas to baseline? How about hard drives? One of the things that I found very interesting, um, I was helping Carlos Perez, uh, uh, actually I was just kind of there along for the ride, but um, Carlos was doing a presentation on using um, Metasploit and how to develop for it. And you know, you can be very crafty with Metasploit, but there's l many, many attacks that will actually alter the hard drive on a system. There is a reason that NCASE is able to charge so much money for their software. NCASE is a, for a hard drive forensics uh, tool. And the reason that they are able to charge that much is because it's able to very easily find those hard drive artifacts. Well, you can, if you know what your hard drive looks like and you trust it and it's good, you can very easily do that on your own and save yourself a lot of money just by using things like the open source version of Tripwire. Applications, especially services. It kills me when people just like throw a web server out on the internet and they say, well, there you go, Sonny. Hope you don't get owned. You know, if you look through those application logs, you will see people that are fuzzing and doing all sorts of stuff. It's just the cost of being online if you're a web server. 
But you should be at least minding that log, finding out what sort of attacks are coming against your site. Um, one of the things that I find very telling is that I'll often, um, I'll, I'll actually set up HoneyNet machines that are just like little web applications that don't do much of anything, and I'll just actually like look through the logs and I'll be like, wow, look at that cross-site scripting that they did. That was really quite cool. And I add that to my attack list. So, you know, know what is expected behavior. Also, look at your people. You know, it's very telling that, um, you know, it's simple on a Unix system or, or on a Windows system to remotely find out how many people are interactively logged into that machine at that moment. Do you monitor that? You should. Because when somebody logs into your accounting file system at, you know, 3.30 in the AM on a Saturday, it's probably not the accounting team. It's probably me on an engagement, if you're lucky. If you're not, it's one of the guys wearing the Guy Fox masks. So, you know, be sure to just take a look at what your hard drive is. Know what it is. Look at your applications. Know what the good state is. And for God's sakes, understand what your people should be doing and when and how. With what systems do they interact? Now, I'm going to kind of abstract it a little bit. I want to chat about, you know, I don't, let me, let me back up. I don't know your network. I don't know your company. I don't know your infrastructure. You do. That's why you get paid what I hope are big bucks. I don't know. I hope. <laughs> um, you should know what is important for your company. So what I want to talk about are some like more abstract things of like what are some things that you should monitor or how you should monitor going forward when you go back home and you start going to work. There's things that you might want to check all the time to just make sure that they're running. You know, the, the normal heartbeat monitor. You know, is, you know, the web server up and serving web pages? Most places do that, you know. That's fine. Make sure that you have heartbeat checks everywhere that's appropriate. Okay? Now, less common, though, are looking for the single bad unexpected events. These are harder to search for. And unless you have a baseline, I would contend that you couldn't, you wouldn't be able to know what it is. You know, a perfect example of this would be something like, you know, I, I often see like people have, uh, this is Cricket, uh, or maybe this is RRD tool, but they'll have this like bandwidth utilization monitor or, you know, some device detector type thing. And they'll say, well, you know, clearly Monday and Tuesday things were bad because it spiked all the way up. and you know, Wednesday, Thursday were great because it was like half as bad. And you know what? That's cool. God bless. I love it that you do that. You know, but you need to do a little bit more than just looking at what your top talkers are. Okay? Every, almost everybody does that, and that's good. Don't stop doing that. But look out for the things that are your bottom talkers. This is the scary. Okay, and I don't mean David Hasselhoff, although he does kind of creep me out. Um, one of the scariest incident responses I was ever involved in, I go on site and I say, all right, let's look at your logs and all your systems and all this stuff. And I look and I see like pretty normal traffic. And then I, I say, okay, what are your bottom five talkers? This was a Windows environment like most corporate places are. And there were a series of uh, four workstations that in the past 30 days had sent a total of 15 packets. These systems were on for those 30 days. Is that not the scariest thing you've ever seen? Can you ever even have a Windows machine be up for more than a minute and sending that low amount of traffic? And this was in a domain. Yes, those Windows workstations were compromised, but even worse than that, the network monitoring systems were compromised. They didn't have any baseline. They didn't know what was normal. Their network was shredded. It was bad. 
That's why you need baselines. What's even scarier, though, is sometimes, and this is my Zen slide, just kind of, you know, just got done talking about a scary incident. What about, how do you monitor something that never ever changes? You know, do you monitor that? I don't know. You know, you need to be thinking of what sort of things do I want? What sort of things do we need? I know that, and believe me, I've been there. Uh, it, it, a certain nerve like twitches whenever I have someone in management come to me and they go, hey, we need a dashboard. And I'm like, oh, oh. Yeah, and, and I see you chuckling, right? Because like, my network is complex. It's a beautiful thing. There's thousands of servers, tens of thousands of applications, terabytes of data, and you want a little green, yellow, red? It can't be you know, simplified that way. I hate to tell you, but if you're making things that complex, you're making it that complex on yourself too. Find out ways to reduce the volume of information that you take in on a day-to-day -day basis. There's um, some really good books out there on data security visualization and data visualization. Go out and Google them. I'm going to be posting some stuff on how to... Um, on, on these books, They're, I highly recommend them. Um, there's a lot of data geeks out there, and listen to them. So, what's next? You know, we know that um, we have options, right? One of the one of my favorite quotes from Albert Einstein, and I don't know if he actually said this or not, was, "If you're always going to try the same thing over and over again." and expect different results, that's the definition of insanity. And oftentimes, that's what we do. You know, um, Dave and Kevin, when they gave their talk, they were talking about how the spending has been increasing at a very steep rate, and that the attacks were actually going at a very steeper rate. That's not good math. We keep on throwing more money at the problem, and the results keep getting worse. I'm not saying throw less money at the problem, by all means. I'm not, I'm not that crazy. I'm not that angry. But we, it might be time to change the game plan, you know? When the West Coast style offense, you know, in football came to pro predominance, rushing became a whole lot less important. People had to adjust. These past couple months, the game has changed, whether you like it or not. We need to adjust. The option isn't very pretty. And I don't, like I said earlier, I don't have all the answers. You know, I've got some ideas. I'm sure you do too. Let's get out there and collaborate. Let's make something happen. You have to try something, because the current status quo just simply isn't working. One of my favorite quotes is, you miss 100% of the shots you never take. Just go out there and try it. See if it sticks on the wall. If it does, you're cool. You know, another good quote, though, is the problem with quotes on the internet is that it's hard to verify their authenticity from Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm finishing a little early so that we can have some time for Q&A. Thank you so much for attending and listening. Thank you, DerbyCon folks um, and all the podcast folks for getting me through other days when I'm having a rough run. Feel free to contact me. Uh, you can reach me at mickatpaul.com, uh, .com. The extra .com is because we care. And uh, I'm at Better Safety Net. So any questions? Okay, well, thank you all for your time, and have a great rest of the con.